My 365 Podcasts with me, Pete Cohen. Hi, this is Pete Cohen and you join me for another podcast. Today I have a special guest, a guy who goes by the name of Ben Pratt. Ben, how you doing? I'm really good, Pete. It's good to be with you. Excellent. Tell me just a little bit about yourself. What, what do you do? Um, I essentially am a, a, a fitness and, a, and nutrition lecturer. Um, I work for a company called Premier Training. Uh, I've also run my own business and um, I have spent quite a bit of, ye- of years uh, in the fitness industry, probably about 15 years in total, um, teaching, training, lecturing and, uh, and helping people to get themselves in shape. So. Okay, so one of your areas of expertise is nutrition. Yes, particularly nutrition. Okay, well that to me is an area that's fascinating for many, many different reasons. Um, what I'd like to focus on today is um, the diet that people who want to lose weight should consider eating. Mm-hmm. Um, why do you think, just to start off with, people in general struggle to lose weight? I think probably one of the biggest reasons why many people struggle to lose weight is to do with misinformation, most of all, yeah. uh, in that we're, there's a lot of people out there competing for business, there's a lot of people trying to make some money on particularly food products, and uh, therefore a lot of the information that the public are told uh, is not fully informed. And so many people go out there looking for food products that are going to help them, looking for strategies that will help them, and they're relying on information that perhaps is not as reliable as it could be. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, they're already at a disadvantage in striving to achieve success. Because I, I suppose you know that lots of people who lose weight probably um, are always looking at food in relationship to calories, what they mm-hmm. shouldn't eat, what they should eat. And I, 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 from my experience, I see a lot of people really get confused mm-hmm. by what is what is the right food and the wrong food to eat. Mm-hmm. So are you, are you an advocator that people should just be, if they want to lose weight, it's just a real question of not eating very many much food? Um... Calories is a, is, has been the backbone of weight loss for a lot of years. And counting calories, uh, I don't think is something we should ignore. But at the same time, we, I think we do get caught up with the counting calories way too much. You know, if we were to go back and look at traditional man, um, long before we even knew what a calorie was, they didn't sort of take down a boar and sit down to eat this meat and think, I can't eat that because it's got too many calories in it. They hmm. would just eat as they needed to and as the body was was required and they would eat according to the sensations and feelings that they had if they had appetite they would eat if they didn't they wouldn't and I think the modern diet industry today um, makes us believe that hunger or appetite is wrong you know we hear words like curb hunger fight back you know cravings as though those things are wrong yeah and I don't believe for a second that feeling hunger or feeling a craving is inherently a bad thing yeah it's your body trying to communicate something to you to be able to understand what it needs. Yeah, because a lot of people have cravings for for sugar, right? Mm-hmm, that's true. And uh, again, this is often because sugar partly is a highly addictive substance. And uh, we can definitely uh, become addicted to that. You know, scientists have shown us that when we eat things like sugar and chocolate, the same areas in our brain that respond to drug addiction also respond to those foods. Mm. And so when we get very, very caught up with the high sugary diet that we have, we can become addicted to those things. Yeah. Often, though, what the body really needs is not sugar because sugar puts a strain on the stress on the body. It doesn't provide us with the nutritional needs that the body has. And we've got to remember, again, if I go back to that idea of traditional man, we didn't have processed sugar. So they yeah. never suffered from those kind of food addictions. Okay, so why don't we look at sugar for just to start off with. Mm-hmm. How do people uh, learn to uh, cut sugar down? And why, why, is it, why, does the problem, why does the body have so much of a problem with it in the first place? Um, the body has a challenge with sugar because it doesn't, as a processed form in sort of like the white or even the brown sugar, the crystalline form we purchase it in, um, it has no nutrients that come with it by the empty calories. It's gone through a multiple processing stage in the factory so that what we get is, is literally, as often we hear, empty calories. However, to be able to burn that up, for your body to utilize the energy contained within it, it requires vitamins and minerals in abundance in order to do that, particularly B vitamins and other minerals that are necessary. Now, when we eat a sugary compound that doesn't have those nutrients in it, the body has to find them from somewhere. And usually what happens is it begins to draw on the limited stores that our body will keep. And that can be a real challenge if we don't have a good stockpile of vitamins and minerals within our own body because of the foods we've been eating. Mm -hmm. 
And so scientists refer to sugar these days as what we would call an anti-nutrient in that it provides us fewer micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals, than it supplies us. Yeah. And therefore, it's like, uh, the way I look at it, it's almost like, you know, withdrawing from your bank account rather than depositing. Yeah. We think we're depositing because we're eating, but the reality is the micronutrients are being withdrawn and we end up in a slightly worse condition. Yeah. So I suppose that's why a lot of children today, health is so poor, it's because they aren't eating many natural foods or good quality foods which have the vitamins and minerals in it. They're actually eating lots of processed foods with high sugar content that they eat those foods that actually deplete them even more of the vitamins and minerals they need for their bodies to work, for them to grow, for them to be healthy, right? Yeah, that would be absolutely correct. And not all children eat that way, you know, but a lot of kids that we see do eat that way. And, you know, we, we know that this begins to reflect on their behavior and the way in which they act and, and the things in which they do because their body goes through blood sugar kind of roller coaster rides. Yeah, well, when, from eating foods which have a very high sugar content, like drinking cans of soft drink, from eating bars of chocolate. Um, yes, but at the same time, not always the way we yeah. think. Something like a bar of chocolate actually doesn't have quite the same sugar speed and delivery as something like a can of, of fizzy drink. Yeah. Um, a fizzy drink doesn't have any other nutrients in it. You know, a, a chocolate bar has protein and fats in it that slow down that, that delivery. So yeah. I'm not necessarily saying, although we'd love to know that chocolate is good, but um, most chocolate that we purchase today isn't particularly great in terms of overall nutritional value. Yeah. There are better chocolates that would still be okay in small amounts. And actually kids. quite good for you as well. Yeah, they Some still of the darker nutrients. chocolates, you mean with a high cocoa content? Yeah, and particularly if we were looking towards more organic and fair trade versions, you tend to find there's a lower sort of pesticide chemical residue. Um, unfortunately, cocoa is one of the plants that's well known for uh, pesticide use. Yeah. And, uh, and if it's not an organic version, then you can guarantee it's been sprayed and then those residues get into the chocolate and that can upset hormonal chemistry in the body as well. So uh, I am not too harsh on the chocolate front. I allow a little bit of moderation and leeway with that one. But certainly things like fizzy drinks, um, I've seen kids you know, a million times over respond within minutes to things like that, to sugary drinks, and you just watch their behavior go down. Whether they've gone for the kid-friendly sugar-free drink or not, yeah. you still see this really marked response in their behavior and the way in which they act. So if people want to lose weight, it's probably quite important for them. If they want to lose weight, and more importantly, keep the weight off, um, cutting down sugar and maybe, uh, maybe even cutting it out of the diet as, as much as possible is something you would advocate? Yes, definitely, and not just sugar. Um, we've got to, if we were going to quantify this, we've got to be aware that one of the big reasons why sugar is a challenge, not only to health but also to to weight loss, is because of how it affects blood insulin levels. Mm -hmm. And to kind of just you know lay this one down for the listeners, when we take in sugar, sugar levels in the blood will rise quite rapidly, and then blood insulin levels have to rise as well. Now, insulin is a very important hormone in that it helps to bring blood sugar levels back down, but it does this by sending the sugar into the cells. Now, it doesn't only send it into muscle cells for contraction and for work. It also sends it into nervous cells and liver cells, but in particular, it helps to push energy and nutrients into fat cells as well. And any fats in the foods that we've eaten can only be stored and locked into your fat cells when there is available glucose, which comes from the sugar. Yeah. So there has to be a source of glucose to lock in fats into our fat cells. And once that's present, they can stay there. And particularly if we continue to eat a high sugar diet or a high carbohydrate diet, and that could be from breads and pastas as well, yeah. then there's continually high levels of blood sugar continually high levels of blood insulin and then we're continually in a storing state yeah. for fat rather than a releasing state and to yeah. me that's a really really key issue yeah so how do people get to that point where there's more of a releasing state of fat so they're burning it well definitely one of the first things that has to be looked at is what the continual levels of insulin are at yeah um, if someone is having chronic insulin spikes all day So you long. mean like craving sugar all the time or just energy levels dipping? Yeah, I mean, perhaps a, a way to think of this is to, for people to consider how they react to their food and to their body throughout the day. I mean, if they're getting a typical thing you find with a lot of people is busy in the morning, no time 
for breakfast, so they might have a coffee and a toast on the way out the door. Yeah. And by 10 o'clock, they're desperately hungry. And so yeah. they snack on something that probably isn't the best choice. They get to lunch, and then they have to rush through a quick lunch of a sandwich of some kind, which again has a pile of carbohydrates in it. They then probably by 2 o'clock have a crash, looking for tea, coffee, maybe a quick snack. By 4 o'clock, we find another crash. And then we start to see, by the time people get home, they're, and I'm sure many people can relate to this, they're desperately hungry. Yeah. And so when they get in the door, they don't have the desire to quickly make something. They want the fastest thing they can eat, which is normally something like yeah. biscuits or crisps. And then they've got the time, once they've quelled their urge for food, to sit down and prepare a meal. Yeah. And so for me, I've met many clients and many students in my teaching who experience that on a regular basis. That's a normal day feeling us the need for a snack mid-morning and a couple of times throughout the afternoon because they feel their blood sugar crashing. Yeah. Now, blood sugar is crashing because of the insulin levels that keep being pushed up too high and then sending blood sugar low and then we respond in a way that we perhaps wouldn't respond if we weren't suffering those cravings because of low blood sugar. Yeah. We, we tend to make choices that are worse rather than having the uh, time and ability to make okay. better choices. So for optimal health, and energy, we need to regulate our our blood sugar levels to keep them constant. So Definitely. Ha- and, and that also helps in, in fat release. Mm-hmm. It does. Um, the reason why it helps with fat release, uh, just to clarify that, is because when insulin levels are low, then we are not going to be in a fat storing state. Now, yeah. when we begin to look at hormones in the body in general, we realize that many, many hormones are fat releasing hormones. There's almost hardly any, maybe two, that are fat storing. Right. right. One that comes, the major one being insulin, is yeah. a fat storing hormone, and estrogen in females is also has a role in fat storing if yeah. it becomes out of balance. Because yeah, I see that uh, uh, a lot of people might struggle to lose weight because they're not doing the right sort of exercise or they're not eating very well. But some people do eat fairly well and do it are pretty active and still struggle to lose weight. Definitely. And that seems to me because hormonally they're kind of out of balance. And you're saying that if a diet, if you eat a, high, a diet that's very, very high in sugar, chances are hormonally you are going to be out of balance, which is going to make mm-hmm. it difficult for your body to lose weight. Yeah, definitely. Because um, we've got to remember, hormones are a non-specific compound. When you have hormone levels that become out of balance, it doesn't only affect one thing. Uh, and this has become kind of popular with the low carbohydrate diets that have been pushed in recent years and people saying that by having lower carbohydrates then that helps us to lose weight. And However, you'll notice that in people who do that, they do lose weight quite a lot of them, but they also then notice that other areas of their health begin to decline. They might not have such stable emotions and things like that. Yeah. So I don't advocate no carbohydrates, but I do think in someone who needs to lose weight, they definitely need to reduce those carbohydrates. Well, so what sort of carbohydrates down. should they reduce? Because one of the tools of my program is cutting down and cutting out sugar. Mm-hmm. And I encourage people to do that. People who basically do crave a lot of sweet things mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. always feel the need to eat something sweet after a meal. Um, and I encourage them. And then obviously that includes alcohol as well mm-hmm. and also stimulants. And mm-hmm. I and I encourage people to cut them down. And often when they cut them down, to start off with, they have withdrawal. Why do people have withdrawal when they when they start to cut those things out of the body? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, partly it'll be because, as we've said before, the, the centers of the brain that are responsible for addiction start to respond because the thing that they've become reliant on aren't there. Uh, aren't there. So that's, that's one thing. It's, if they start to have withdrawal, they were probably addicted to that substance in some respect. The other thing is that the body, uh, say for example, if we stick with sugar uh, and carbohydrates, um, the body is used to having quite high insulin levels. Yeah. And usually when someone's had a period of time, maybe a few years, where they've been eating a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of sugar and a lot of flour and pastas and, and starchy carbohydrates that, that certainly elevate blood sugar to quite high levels, then the cells of the body start to resist the effects of insulin. If you could almost imagine if I was to start feeding somebody food and I kept on feeding them and kept on feeding them, and there's going to come a point where they start, they won't open their mouth yeah. because they don't want any more because they're starting to feel unwell. Yeah. And the cells work a little bit like that. If we constantly have insulin in the blood, then the cells are constantly being told to take in sugar. Yes. And there comes a point where the cells lock down and say, I can't accept anymore. And they become resistant to insulin. And so you start to find people have these withdrawals and they start to feel terrible fatigue because their cells will not allow glucose in. Yeah. Because they become resistant to protect them from overfeeding, so to speak. Yes. Now, this is a real challenge in that when people 
start to cut back on their carbohydrates, their blood insulin levels are now at lower levels than ever before. Yeah. Yet their cells still have that resistant element to them. So yeah. now the cells are really lacking and suddenly the body's crying out for some energy and what are they go looking for they go looking for the source of energy that they've always yeah, relied on that, that makes uh, perfect sense so how do people get over that how do people get to the point because i encourage people to if it's to either cut it down these things like cut down your alcohol mm -hmm. cut down your your simple sugar intake you know your soft drinks your cakes your your biscuits your chocolate cut them down and for some people i encourage well just cut them down and then cut them out mm -hmm. for around about three weeks mm -hmm. to give your body a chance to uh resensitize itself for you mm -hmm. to not be so drawn towards these foods and then possibly after three weeks maybe start to reintroduce some of them mm -hmm. and i find that when people do that um they actually start to lose weight and they feel they've actually got some control back. They're not so addicted to these substances. So if someone wanted to go down that road, what sort of foods would you encourage them to replace those sugary foods with? Mm -hmm. um, what I would be looking at it with, with most clients is to begin to, to gradually cut back. If we try to put some percentages in place and we look at, well, what is the, the government's current guidelines for carbohydrate intake? They're actually fairly high. They're in around 50 to 60% of calories. And... Most people are setting what is a high sugar intake as being above that. But for me, already at that level, 56% of calories is a high carbohydrate intake. Yeah. And so when we're looking at you know, various even sporting activities like in sports nutrition, guys are being looked at to intake 75% carbohydrates, which is exceptionally high. Yeah. And there really isn't any traditional culture that's known to man that ate you know, processed and starchy carbohydrates to that level. So we've got to look at saying 50 to 60% of our calories of starchy carbohydrates is already high and therefore we need to lower it from that point. Yeah. If someone's eating it in excess of that, then we know that they're well above what is even advised. Yeah. If they're eating less than that, then we can begin to ease back okay. a little bit more. I usually aim to bring them down to a sort of a 30 to 40% level of, of carbohydrates uh, in terms of their total calories, particularly like you suggested, Pete, avoiding the refined sources. You know, definitely getting rid of things like chocolate cakes, biscuits. And I've generally found most people don't need to be told that. They already know that yeah, those things yeah. aren't great. Where people sometimes trip up is in that they, you know, we're often told that things like, like pasta and rice and breads are, are perfectly healthy because they are made from grains. But so many breads on the market today are highly processed, are full of compounds that are not good for us. Yeah. And the blood sugar response is often very, very similar. When we look at things like white pasta and white rice, again, you get very large blood sugar responses. So if we were to just tell people, get off sugar and eat these healthy grain-based foods, yeah. we're going to see the same insulin response. Yeah. So, so, my, so what food should people eat in, instead of those foods? So my approach is generally to look at the what I refer to as the, as the non-starchy fruit and vegetables that are around. Like, like, like what? Such as, you know, getting into your root crops, all bar things like sweet potatoes, yams, and potatoes, they're too starchy. So things like uh, you get a lot in your winter veg, your carrots, your parsnips, your yeah. sweet, and things like that, um, preferably an organic source. Yeah. With fruit, I tend to advise that, that we avoid the tropical fruits, which tend to be much higher in sugar, and start to look at ones that you would get here locally in the UK, which being a more temperate climate you tend to find the sugar content like are a apples bit pears yeah apples pears cherries plums berries things like that that grow well here in the uk tropical fruits taste great i used to live in the tropics and it's amazing how good they taste when you're there yeah but personally coming back um after several years out there the tropical fruits in this country are not fantastic and the quality of them even because they've had to be transported in is considerably reduced mm -hmm. and so let's rely on the fruits that are natural to this region and natural to this country the sugar levels tend to be lower and they tend to have less trouble in our blood sugar responses as well. So if people want to supplement uh, tip, uh, the normal types of simple sugars, mm -hmm. what, what are better sugars for them to have? I mean, if they want to still have something sweet. So you're saying fruit. Mm. Are there any sort of... What about sweeteners? Ooh, that's a... That's an interesting area. Yeah. Sweeteners opens up a whole can of worms. But, but just in general, mm. I mean, from what I know, sweeteners aren't great, and they, they confuse not. the body even more. And mm. you know, our ancestors didn't have sweeteners. They definitely um, didn't. But they're not great, no. The four major sweeteners that are available in most food products are aspartame, um, sucralose, asulfame K, and saccharin. And uh, it doesn't take an awful lot of research. You could do a quick Google search in any one of those, and you quickly come up against things that that suggest that they're not great. Um, 
one of the bigger problems I have with sweeteners and, and weight loss is it, they're sold on the idea of low calories. Right? Yeah. We take in a food that still tastes sweet, but it's lower in calories. The challenge with that, though, is that the body obviously has a learned response. There's many markers that stimulate insulin. Yeah. And certain sweeteners, for example, like sucralose and sulfine K, have been shown easily to cause a preemptive blood insulin response. Yeah. So people take them in. There isn't calories that go with it, but it tastes sweet. The body then releases insulin into the blood, and if your blood sugar is already low, but you haven't put energy in, yeah. it then sends it even lower. So if your blood sugar drops, you're going to get cravings and feel a need for something else, even uh, though yes. you've had a low-calorie sweetener. Yeah. Okay, so sweeteners aren't really that great. But I suppose, you know, for people to have a little bit of uh, some of the exotic fruits, or to have some dried, surely eating things like dried fruits will be better than having, you know, lots of just normal sh white sugar yeah definitely and, and when we uh, look at various aspects of food you know we can always grade anything from very low quality to much better quality and you know comparing to sugar there's an awful lot of things that are better than sugar yeah you know if we were looking at something like dried fruit then yes that would be a step better yeah again it will depend on how the fruit is prepared a lot of dried fruits are prepared with sugar and become crystalline yeah um, so I would avoid any added sugar in dried fruits and you'd just be looking at, at fruits that that were just literally sun dried okay. if possible so you're saying round about 30% of the diet should be carbohydrate based so what should the rest of the diet kind of contain? Well, The rest of the diet really needs to look towards fats and, and, and proteins um, I've noticed in recent years as people have looked towards that type of approach a lower carbohydrate a slightly higher fat and protein diet there seems to be a real em emphasis on lean proteins Yeah. Um, but lean proteins are, can be quite a challenge to the body and so my emphasis is more to do with healthy fats and eating good quality fats because fats don't cause an insulin response um, if we look at if we were to look at a blood sugar curve versus a, a, a fat intake curve you, you get virtually nil on the insulin response and if that level stays down then the hormone that signals to our cells to begin to store fat isn't going to be doing it, that job yeah and that means that what fats we eat will be able to be transported into fat cells but unlike when we eat sugar they will also be able to be transported out yeah we tend to think of our adipose tissue or our fat cells as, a, as a, a place of pure storage and once it's in, it's in. And although our bodies might look like that's what's happening, that's not the case unless insulin levels are high. Mm -hmm. When insulin levels are high, then we continue to store and we don't release. When we allow insulin levels to drop back down, then the fats in our fat cells start to become released. Yeah. And typically the way we've learned to do that is to starve ourselves. So people go on very restrictive diets blood sugar levels get very low, they get very hungry and they hate life, but whilst that's going on, their body's releasing fats. Yeah. If we avoid foods that cause a high insulin response in the first place, then the body's going to naturally be doing that. It'll naturally... Just naturally do it. It'll release... So eating fat actually helps you to do that? Eating the right kinds of fats definitely do. Okay, well that's something we should definitely, uh, we should definitely talk about. So just in summary, just about this subject of... of of sugar let's look at uh, good sugars great sugars exceptional sugars for someone that wants mm -hmm. to lose weight so if someone just wants to lose weight and uh, they're going to be good at it what sort of sugars would they be eating are we talking processed and refined sugars yes there? whatever whatever okay. if we're looking at things to sweeten your food naturally yeah. to sweeten food because we have a sweet taste you know the body was built with that taste and yeah. it does taste nice when we have something that's good I'd say the first thing we want to do is, is avoid the processed and refined sugars yeah. and focus on sugars that are more unrefined. You can buy organic unrefined sugars out there, um, at, even at most supermarkets. And if you're going to use that, that would be a, a good start. Yeah. You've, you've got away from the most heavily processed and you're eating a sugar that's got a little more natural molasses in it, which will carry some minerals. Yeah. That's a small step forward, but I would be looking at people probably halving or reducing their sugar content considerably, even though they switch to that. And cutting down alcohol... Um, alcohol is loaded with sugar, you know, there's, there's very little alcohol on the market that hasn't increased its percentage of alcohol, but also increased its sugar right. content. So, so I, someone who's going to be good at it would probably just cut down, not drink too much, yeah, probably we'd, drink better alcohol. We'd want to get them down to, I'd say, for good, we'd want to get them down to the levels that the government advise, which okay. is no more than two to three units for ladies, and, or three to four for guys. Oh, that's, that's a day. You can't save them up and have them at the weekend. Okay, and someone who's good maybe would, rather than drinking sugary soft drinks, might drink uh, a low calorie you know diet drink um personally i generally avoid that yeah um i would much rather that they had a soft drink that they knew what was in it 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if they wanted to have a soft drink kit on the odd occasion, I generally get them to look for ones that did not have other harmful compounds in it. Right. So maybe even a fruit juice. Fruit juices again, if they came from an organic source, and that's that's good. Yeah. Right. Um, because then we know that there isn't going to be chemical pesticide residues. And I know uh, I've mentioned this already, but if if we have those residues in in the food, then that starts to mess up our hormones. Yeah. And if we start to mess up our hormones, and that has a long-standing effect on our on our body's chemistry and can have negative effects but on I weight suppose gain. someone who's good at it, I mean, we can handle these pesticides. We probably don't know long-term what, well, we probably do know they are doing damage to mm. us. But to the whole organic side of things opens up a big, uh, another area of debate for people as to mm. whether they should go organic. And maybe that's another mm. conversation that, that we could have mm -hmm. because we're not going to convince everyone to go organic for, True. for so many different reasons, from the reasons of it's not always convenient for some people and, and often you know the price is more expensive. But what you're saying is for someone who wants to be good at losing weight um, from a sugar perspective, they're going to probably cut down the amount of alcohol they drink, they'll probably drink better sources of alcohol, um, they'll eat less biscuits and cakes and chocolate. Definitely, yeah. Um, and they'd have probably fruit juices instead of sugary drinks maybe mix those with water you'd say organic is the way to go with that i would say if we're going to go on the fruit juice line then i would say yeah a good thing would be to to, to mix it you know, if you mix the water with the fruit juice then at least you're going to cut down the amount of sugar because what we often forget with fruit juice we tend to think of it it's just as good as fruit but it's yeah. not it's yeah. different it's processed yeah There's a lot of fruit juice there. well a lot of fruit juices come from concentrates as well which have been pasteurized in the country it was it was grown they were pasteurized when they get here any nutrients that are there are pretty much gone gone and left and yeah. so then we have a drink that is rich in sugar yeah but what else is there to help you digest the sugar remember we talked about vitamins and minerals necessary for metabolizing sugar yeah so a lot of fruit juices lack anything of any value uh, the other thing that happens is if you were to take say the size of a regular apple yeah. and we were to drink that volume of juice yeah. you will get twice the amount of sugar in the juice as you will just by eating the apple yeah so personally I'm not a big fan of juices I'd much rather they it, just ate the apple yes Okay, so what about someone who wants to be great at uh, losing weight uh, from a sugar point of view? What would, what would they be doing? If somebody wanted to be great, then we would begin to get away from things like, even like the unrefined organic sugars. And I would start to advise other sources. Um, for example, we'd push them towards things like, that are a bit more naturally occurring, like honey and uh, maple syrup. Yeah. Um, those maple syrup, uh, particularly uh, if it's pure maple syrup, it's a protected term. It can't have anything else in it. Don't buy the imitation maple syrups. They're just full of a type of sugar called high fructose corn syrup, which is even worse than sugar. Yeah. So you've got to get pure maple syrup. It has less calories than typical sugar. It even has less calories than honey, and yeah. it carries it's valuable interesting minerals. Interesting, because people just don't know about that, do they? No, they don't. They still think it's a bad thing to have. The but challenge with maple syrup is the cost. It's a little bit more costly. But I think that's a good thing, and that, that yeah. might motivate people to use less of it. Yeah. Because they know it's a little bit more expensive. But they still get a little bit of sweetness. Okay. And what about what else would they do? Someone who wants to be great. So they'd move away from pretty much eating simple sugars. They'd mm -hmm. eat maple, maple syrup, good sources of honey. Mm -hmm. Anything else they'd do? They'd eat probably lots of good, good fruits. They can begin to use fruits to their advantage, you know. If people have the, the desire, they quite like to bake or cook, which, uh, you know, I, I don't tell people you can never have, like, a cake or something like that, but if you made it yourself, at least you know what's in it. Yeah, yeah. And if you were to look at the ingredients list on a typical supermarket cake these days, it's something like 60, 70 ingredients long. When I make a cake, I use five. Yeah. And so at least when you've made it, you've got rid of a lot of the harmful stuff, and you know how much sweetness you put in. You can suit your tastes. And that's where fruit really comes into its own, because you can use fruit in a cake to add yeah. natural sweetness rather than loading up with a pile of sugar. Okay, and what about someone who wants to be exceptional in the area of weight loss and, mm. their, and their, their connection with sugar? If they really wanted to be exceptional, then this is where I, I'd probably want to remove all refined sources of sugar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are a few thoughts on, that, that we can look at on here. In this country, it's a little bit difficult to get hold of, but there is a herb called stevia. And stevia is a, a herb that's been used uh, by American Indians for a long, long time. And uh, it is sweet. And it comes in a powdered form, which you can buy. Um, you'd probably, in this country, need to purchase on the internet. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you that sweetness, but it's a natural herb. It doesn't have a whole pile of calories to it or anything like so that. So that, that, and then you obviously maple syrups and a good mate on honey. Maple syrups for me, I, by this stage, I, I'm looking for people to look towards um, organic maple syrups. Yeah. Or if we're looking for honey, it needs to be raw, unprocessed honey, particularly local to your region. Yeah. And if you can find a local supplier of raw, unprocessed honey, the great thing about that is, one, not only do you get 
a natural source of, of sugar, but you yeah. also get vital minerals to help you absorb it. You yeah. get natural pollens that help to cut back on, uh, help to build up an immunity to things like hay fever and things like that as well. There's a whole pot of other benefits. So this is just one area. We've really, we've really been focusing on the area of sugar and looking mm -hmm. at giving people some ideas of what it might be to be good, great, or exceptional mm -hmm. uh, with their relationship with sugar. Of course, that's up to any individual to do what they want. Mm -hmm. But I suppose even if someone was exceptional at it uh, with their relationship with sugar, maybe from time to time they would have a simple form of sugar, but they probably wouldn't beat themselves up mm -hmm. about it because they know how important eating... Mm -hmm. Well, if we go back to the analogy we made earlier at the start of the podcast when we were talking about a, a bank account, yeah. if you think of the human body as like a bank account, and as long as we are you know, depositing into that bank account more often than we're withdrawing, yeah. then we're going to be in a healthy state. Um, we know fine well if we keep withdrawing from the bank account of vitamins and minerals, yeah. then eventually the, the bank manager gets on the phone and says, what's going on? Yeah. You're, you're, you're nearly broke. Which if we can, you know, I usually look at an 80-20 rule. If 80% of our, our, our food intake is of good quality, then on the odd occasion, we have more than enough in reserve to, to, to be cope able to with, deal with it. the simple yeah, sugars that, that happen now and again. Because I think when we talk about sugar, what we're really focusing on is it's almost like if you want the weight loss to happen, you've got to look at it from a health point of view first of all. If Definitely. you look at it from the health way, then the weight loss will happen. I agree. Yeah. So listen, uh, this has been really interesting. Can you just tell us a little bit about, because you've got a couple of very interesting websites that I think uh, some of our listeners will really be uh, excited to go and have a look at. Just tell me. Sure. The uh, the first website that, that I run and probably my primary site is called the Natural Food Finder. So that's www.naturalfoodfinder.co.uk. And what's that for? For people who want to find out where they can get natural food? It's exactly what it says in the name. This is uh, Fantastic. If you go to the site, there is about 15 or 16 different food categories. And what we do is we rate the different types of foods and, and give you some guidance as to whether you're trying to avoid certain things, what foods to look for that would be good, what would be the best. Yeah. And when you go on there, as you click into each category, it then lists people who sell those foods. So really, it's like a network to link you to suppliers of good quality food. Fantastic. So, uh, you know, I think that works really well with what we've been talking about today, with sort of the, the good, the great, and the exceptional individual, that you'll be able to then go, right, for sugar or for sweeteners, yeah. and go on to there and find exactly those kind of sources and who sells them. Fantastic. And the other site? The other site's called Nutrition's Playground, and uh, that's a site predominantly for information I have a great library of information on there of various articles good quality videos to look at and, and audio programs to, to look into so that would be a great place to go just to gain better information and what's that website again? that's www.nutritions-playground.com ok Ben look, thank you very much I really appreciate uh, your time and uh, for those of you that listen to this podcast please make a comment let us know if it's been useful and what you've gotten out of it and uh Check out my program, PeteCohen.tv, for those of you that aren't on the program. Once again, Ben, many thanks. That was absolutely inspirational. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you want more free inspiration to optimize your life so you can achieve your goals in all the different areas of your life, then visit my365.me. That's my, M-I, 365.me and sign up to 365 days of free coaching with me, Pete Cohen. Thanks for listening and have an awesome day.